Hello, my name is Brad Langford, and welcome to Lecture 2. Today we will be focusing on antimicrobial stewardship in urinary tract infections and asymptomatic bacteriuria. These are our objectives for today's talk. So here's the definition of asymptomatic bacteriuria. We need to talk about asymptomatic bacteriuria first because it is so common and in fact probably more common than urinary tract infection. There's really been a lot of recent focus on this topic because it represents a major reason why antibiotic are overused, uh, particularly in hospitals and, nur and nursing home settings. There's new guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America that help to address this issue, so I encourage you to take a look at those guidelines, which are referenced at the bottom of the screen. So the definition of asymptomatic bacteriuria is the presence of one or more bacteria in the urine without specific urinary tract symptoms. As mentioned, ASP is very common, and it depends a lot on the population. So if you were to sample um, older men, about 40% of them will have bacteria in the urine at any given time. Similarly, up to 50% of women will have asymptomatic bacteriuria. And catheterized patients are very likely, virtually all of them will have um, bacteria in the urine after a week or so of having a catheter in place. So the key point here is that the old school teaching that the urine is normally sterile is incorrect when thinking about older patients. Um, so because of this, anytime we assume that nonspecific symptoms are related to urinary tract infection, we may end up incorrectly attributing these symptoms to the urine because it is so commonly positive. So what are these um, nonspecific signs and symptoms? Cloudy or smelly urine is commonly mistaken as symptoms of a urinary tract infection. But in fact, changes in the color, uh, the smell of, of the urine alone should not be used to diagnose a UTI as they're a very nonspecific and there can be many other reasons why the, the color and the clarity and the smell may change. And this is often affected by diet, uh, medications, as well as hydration status. So in these patients, it's uh, prudent to not send the urine for culture unless the resident or the patient really has true signs and symptoms of infection. So one of the most common reasons for checking the urine in an older person is that they've had a fall or that they're acting differently and have changes in their mental status. These situations should be, um, could be caused by many factors, including the medications that they're on, uh, dehydration status, uh, pain, or the environment. Um, so those things need to really be ruled out before concluding the cause was due to an infection. So in most cases, it's really safe to hold off on antibiotics, watch and wait for about 24 to 48 hours, and provide fluids where appropriate. So even fever, which is typically considered a common sign of infection, uh, we should be cautious about. Um, fever can occur in the elderly, but there could be other reasons why fever may exist, including, for example, a viral infection or, or a pneumonia. So a urine culture should not be sent unless no other causes of fever can be identified. So when trying to diagnose a UTI, you may often see a urinalysis or a dipstick being done. And the important thing to know about this is that these tests are very poor at diagnosing UTI. What they can do is to help you rule out a urinary tract infection in situations where they are negative, but they cannot be helpful to rule in a UTI if they are positive. So as mentioned, historically we used to think that bacteria in the urine was a bad thing. But after several randomized controlled trials, it turns out that it's a common finding that represents colonization rather than infection. So for this reason, trying to treat asymptomatic bacteria does not bring benefits to most patients, particularly in older patients. However, there are two exceptions in those who are undergoing urological procedures where mucosal bleeding um, is expected is one exception. The other exception is pregnant women, as uh, the presence of bacteria in the urine could lead to pyelonephritis in these, in these women, which can be very harmful for the fetus. So those are the 
the only two exceptions where you would test and treat for asymptomatic bacteriuria. On the other hand, there are known risks to testing and treating for asymptomatic bacteria in all other patients. And these risks include side effects, um, the presence or selection of antibiotic resistant organisms, causing a C. difficile infection, which can uh, be incited by antibiotic therapy, as well as, in fact, the increased likelihood of an actual UTI of, of occurring. And this is because there's a belief that the presence of bacteria colonizing the urine may actually be protective against true urinary tract infections. So um, these bacteria may actually be uh, helpful. And so treating it, it, asymptomatic bacteriuria can make room um, and allow these um, more pathogenic organisms to thrive. So um, another great reason to consider avoiding urine, uh, urinary antibiotics um, in these patients. So how can we manage a patient who has, uh, who has uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria? The guidelines tell us that it is very safe to withhold antibiotics, and we can still do lots for the patient. So if they have altered mental, mental status, it helps to rule out any reasons why this may be the case. And um, it can, we can use this acronym, pinch me. So this acronym or mnemonic, uh, is pretty helpful. It's kind of like a, ch a mental checklist to think of other reasons why altered mental status can occur. And these include pain, infection, constipation, dehydration, medication, and the environment. We should also document that we are not treating the positive culture and explain why. Um, this can be helpful if other clinicians come along and wonder why they, you know, see a positive culture and end up uh, why didn't um, the previous clinician treat it? Uh, we know that many older individuals will present with changes if they're dehydrated, so giving fluids can often um, uh, be helpful if they're not fluid uh, restricted. We also want to monitor for any changes in status. And then know that patients and family will have expectations about antibiotics that may be based on what has happened in the past. So we, we may have to provide some education, explain why antibiotics are not needed, and talk a little bit more about the risks and benefits, and that the risks may outweigh the benefits of uh, treating asymptomatic bacteria in older patients. So we talked about when not to send a urine culture, but when should we be sending a urine culture and initiating antibiotics? So the low criteria, as shown here, are generally accepted indications to initiate antibiotics and send a urine culture to see if it's positive. So if the resident or patient is not catheterized, we're looking for symptoms such as dysuria or two or more of the following, including fever or shaking chills, frequency, urgency, or urinary incontinence, flank pain or suprapubic pain, and gross hematuria. If the patient is catheterized, we're looking for fever or one or more of the following, flank pain, shaking chills, or delirium. You notice that delirium is not noted as, a, as one of the symptoms to watch out for in non-catheterized patients, again, because it is um, very nonspecific. In catheterized patients, uh, because we cannot assess for lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, delirium is included in the, in the algorithm. So not all UTIs are created equal. There are different types that are treated differently. So cystitis, also known as a bladder infection, typically presents with symptoms such as dysuria, frequency, urgency, oliguria, suprapubic pain, and maybe hematuria. Complicated cystitis can present with these exact same symptoms, but occur in patients with complicating factors. And these complicating factors can include the presence of um, male, uh, male sex, immunocompromised status, having a urinary or Foley catheter in place, uh, structural abnormalities of the urinary tract, and stones. So these complicating factors can make UTIs more difficult to treat. So um, we often treat them differently with antibiotics that have good urinary tissue penetration and with a little bit of a, a longer course. Finally, pyelonephritis is an infection of the kidney, and uh, cystitis symptoms may be present, um, but the hallmark of pyelonephritis is that typically flank pain and fever will occur. <laughs>
And notice I haven't used the term urosepsis here. Um, that's because this term is vague and it doesn't really tell us why, what the type of UTI is. Uh, so whenever possible, we should really try to determine which of these buckets our patient's UTI fits into, rather than saying simply they have a urosepsis. So if we suspect our patient has a UTI, we should start empiric treatment. Uh, the local recommendations for hotel juice shaver are shown here uh, based on the susceptibility rates that are occurring in, in this region. There's a preference towards using narrow spectrum, less toxic drugs, and for cystitis, our first-line treatment is nitrofurantoin, or also known as macrobid. Note that macrobid can be safely used in patients with a creatinine clearance above 30 mils per minute. For pyelonephritis or complicated cystitis, amoxicillin clavulanate would be a first choice. Duration is 7 days for complicated cystitis and 10 days for pyelonephritis. In the rare case where we need to use intravenous therapy, starting with a single dose of an aminoglycoside, then switching to oral therapy is reasonable. And these patients may also need to be referred to an acute care center for additional care. So how did we derive these treatment recommendations? Well, they're based on our local susceptibility rates within our region, and these are the uh, regional rates for the um, Hamilton, Haldeman, Niagara region, and obviously will differ slightly from place to place. So we know that the most common bug or pathogen for UTIs is E. coli, so shown here is the E. coli susceptibility uh, rates for uh, different, um, different, or, uh, different drugs. And you can see why nitrofurantoin would be a good empiric choice um, before you know the susceptibility for your particular patient. So on the other hand, you can see why amoxicillin would not be a great choice at 56% susceptibility. So we would not use uh, amoxicillin um, unless we had a culture and susceptibility result that shows that is actually susceptible. So here's a comparison chart of the common oral options that can be used for either empiric or targeted therapy. And without going into too much detail here, I'll reiterate that nitrofurantoin is a preferred option due to low rates of resistance. It's generally well tolerated and it does not drive antimicrobial resistance as much as some of the other drugs do. On the other hand, a commonly used drug is ciprofloxacin. It is generally effective when the organism is susceptible, but there are multiple concerns with this agent, including its likelihood of inducing resistance. Uh, ciprofloxacin and other fluoroquinolones are very high risk for C. difficile infection. And additionally, we're learning more about many black box warnings on this uh, class of drugs. So here's a nice chart from the Duke University Medical Center on the list of fluoroquinolone black box warnings. And although many of these are considered rare side effects, we should really be aware that these risks continue to become evident in an increasing number of populations. So we really should be reserving ciprofloxacin in the fluoroquinolone class of drugs whenever possible. For duration of therapy, it is quite straightforward. The higher up the urinary tract, the longer the duration. Our first line nitrofurantoin for uncomplicated cystitis can be used for as short as five days. Trimethoprim sulfa, on the other hand, can be as short as three days. Complicated cystitis generally is seven days across the board, and pyelonephritis is typically seven to ten days, but complicated pylo may require longer courses. So to reflect on what we've learned, I've provided a little framework here uh, for you to help manage your patients with sus suspected urinary tract infection. Firstly, you'll be assessing for symptoms, and in cases where patients don't meet criteria, we don't want to move further down this path because it is really hard to ignore a positive urine culture once it comes back. Secondly, in patients who have met the criteria, we've sent a urine culture and it is reasonable to start empiric treatment. So we'll use our local guidelines to help choose empiric therapy. 
And third, once you get your culture results back, if it's negative, you can safely stop therapy. If positive, we will use the narrowest spectrum agent possible. And then finally, select your duration of treatment based on the best available evidence, similar to what we've uh, provided in previous slides. So a few take-home messages for you to consider is don't test for asymptomatic bacteriuria or treat asymptomatic bacteriuria with antibiotics in older patients. There are clear criteria for urinary tract infection, including the LOBE criteria, which will help you to select the appropriate uh, treatment. Know that nitrofurantoin is first-line therapy for uncomplicated UTI due to its efficacy and safety. And we really should be avoiding fluoroquinolones whenever possible due to the risks of resistance as well as concerns about several black box warnings. And when it comes to duration of therapy, shorter is really smarter, so we should be using the shortest effective duration whenever possible. And with that, I'll close the lecture. And if there's um, any information that you're looking for with respect to asymptomatic bacteriuria or UTI, here are a couple of recommended resources for you. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you in the next lecture.